Roots Music. Uh, my name is Don Clemens. I'm known as the American Songster, uh, an advocate and a, uh, a musician who's spent a lot of my uh, professional career uh, digging into the archives, pulling out stories and songs of African American culture, and then also applying them into the modern day so that uh, we can witness a little bit of what they call Sankofa, which is a proverb from the Ashanti people off the Gold Coast of Africa, which means go back and fetch it. Not taking everything from the past, but taking the good things that can be useful in the past to take them into the present and into the future. And I'm so glad you all could join us. With me on this panel, we have, um, let's see, I, I got everybody's technical names down here. We have, uh, first, to my immediate left, we have Dr. Stephen Lewis, who's curator over at the National Museum of African American Music, which will be opening next year in Nashville. We have Tarika Dean, who is uh, the great, great niece of the wonderful Judy Ledbetter, better known yeah. as Ledbelly. Yeah. She's the executor of the Ledbelly Estate and uh, is the new queen, as we all know, of, uh, of the, the Ledbelly uh, legacy. So give it up for Tarika Dean. Yeah. And next to her, we have the great Guy Davis, the Kokomo Kid, master of the blues, actor, folk singer, blues musician, uh, and, and now Grammy-nominated blues musician, whose uh, uh, career is, is so varied from uh, uh, days of our lives to Beach Street as an actor, all the way into, uh, into, into being uh, one of the, you know, uh, uh, working with me on different projects, as well as uh, traveling the world constantly. So give it up for Guy Davis, a legend of the Finally, we have Barry Mazur, author and uh, Roots Music Critic for the Wall Street Journal, and uh, he hosts the show on Acme Radio, Roots Now, and uh, you know, I met Barry several years back at the Americana Festival when he had finished his book, uh, Meeting Jimmy Rogers, and uh, the book that followed it, the Ralph Peer and the Making of Popular Roots Music, is, uh, is a quintessential read for anyone that wants to know more about the Roots Music business, and for this panel, uh, discussing a little bit of the African-American contributions to Prince Music. Let's give it up for Barry Mason. Well, there's a million directions that we can go uh, with this particular subject of African-American roots music, because of course, uh, African-American roots music can mean so many different things. Of course, there are the spirituals. Um, there are also the early secular songs, the folk songs like John Henry, the ballads, we can talk about the blues, and if we really want to expand the definition, we can reach it out into the 1890s Black Vaudeville. We can talk about ragtime. We can go in a million directions. So uh, first, I'd like to just kind of take a round with the, the panel and, and ask about how did you get into African-American roots music and kind of your own definitions of it when you came into it and then how that's changed over time. And we'll see if we can do it briefly, but I'd love for everybody to give a little bit of their perspective. So, sure. so my entry into, into African-American roots music was through my interest in early jazz. Uh, and Don just mentioned Bob Bill. Uh, so some research I did as an undergraduate was related to early jazz musicians and kind of Bob Bill shows. Really understanding exactly what that impact was. Uh, and so one of the things that I learned about his music He kind of crossed a lot of different genres of music. So for me, African American roots music uh, encompasses a whole lot from folk to blues to political uh, stance to uh, literally some cowboy songs. And so it's very <coughs> vast for me, my understanding of that music. And I guess that's directly related to the influence that I've had uh, being part of this legacy of his and the type of music. Lord have mercy on one of those people who was infected by that lead belly spirit. Used to go to a summer camp run by Pete Seeger's brother when I was a young fella. And they didn't separate the so-called white music from the black music from the red music. We just all got to sing sing-alongs. We heard about this character named Lead Belly who had sung his way out of prison twice. 
Now, uh, they weaved him into stories about this fellow that was his, uh, let's see, uh, this fellow who's on the chain gang had a special pair of shoes that he kept in the sack, had a heel in the front and a heel in the back. And he took off when he heard the hounds coming, couldn't tell which way the lead belly was running, because he's long gone. So that shows that at least the blues aspect of the Americana music scene is music of survivors. Now, I uh, used to hear songs that stirred me, like there's a man going around taking names. That could be applied to anything. That could be applied to uh, Nazis in the Warsaw Ghetto. That could be applied to uh, black folks, maybe newly freed up, getting ready to get cocked over the head and brought back onto a chain gang. Um, but my personal story has to do with being at that summer camp and wanting to play a five-string banjo. Now, I, my dad bought me a banjo in 1960, precisely the year in American history when a black man did not need a banjo. Well, just <laughs> six years before that, the uh, like, Supreme Court had declared segregation unconstitutional, therefore unlawful, illegal in public schools. And here was Ossie Davis' son waiting on a banjo. And people said, well, man, that's menstrual music. That's, that's Negroid music. You don't have to fool with no banjo. Why don't you get a guitar, go be progressive, like play Josh White and go and Harry Brother Fonte and sing your way forward. But I wanted a five-string man. Unfortunately, my dad did not stigmatize the instrument, and he got one for me. And over the years, it has served me well and opened up a lot of doors, emotionally, musically, and humanitarian day. I guess there's a couple ways I can tell this. Uh, experiences at summer camps of about the same, we're about the same generation. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I think we just figured out one of them that I went to play softball against one that he went to. That he went to. But uh, I was from a kind of a showbiz family for one thing. Uh, my mother, when she was five years old, was singing in vaudeville with Cat Calvin. When I was a kid, my aunt, her sister, was running a performing arts and jazz school in Pennsylvania, and Charlie Parker, some bear, was my roommate. So there was this. Somewhere along the way, among the actors and the dancers, I discovered that the really complicated stuff around me from broken thing and jazz was not my thing. Uh, it was this three-quarter business, and uh, <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I just found out I personally related to. I was a teenager. And I've been pursuing what that meant for 50 years since. Um, from the beginning, that was black music, white music. It's just, what is this stuff? How does it work? Now, where that got me into it, and I guess the angle that's been, what I've written about, what, what that pursuit's been like for over 50 years, was that in that day, you got a version of where African American music came from, among others that was pretty well determined by, by, by the academy, by folklorists, and they had a kind of, um, they didn't like show business very much, and the problem is, this is show business that we're talking about. So that the degree to which um, African American, like other people's, involvement in roots music was at a professional level, practiced, improved, worked, and was for a very long time, became a subject of mine, how does this professional show business angle uh, play off against what was a down on the porch, learning it off a, you know, dipping of screen kind of angle, and uh, how the, the interplay with those back and forth has been going on ever since, and it's kind of what brings us to this place today, it's never stopped, but that's what, that interests me, and that's kind of my angle in those books and other things I do, which is uh, the professional side of what we've made of well, you know, like, just kind of jumping off of that with you, Barry, you know, that was one of the things that I found very early on when I was invited to an event called the Black Banjo Gathering. It was an event focusing on the black and African roots of the banjo. And, and, and like uh, Guy Davis mentioned, I was drawn to the sound of the banjo. Didn't exactly know why, except that having started out playing drums in school, that the banjo and its percussive nature, it was something like it reminded me of playing a snare drum, but being able to make chords on a snare drum in its own type of way. 
So I was drawn to that rhythmic aspect of it. And then when I learned about the deeper history of it, going back to the earliest days of, uh, of enslaved Africans, and, and also the, um, the way that the banjo personifies an idea like Sankofa, which I learned about later on, that was something that really, it took, it took me on a whole other trajectory besides just learning music. It told me a lot about culture. And so that was something that, that drew me in. But it wasn't until I became a professional musician that I really thought about uh, what type of music did I want to present on stage. Of course, my interests are all over the place, but when I decide to be a professional, I want to focus on the types of music that told the greatest cultural story that it could tell. And that's something that I found to be very important, which was uh, wonderful that you mentioned that, uh, Barry. But I'd like to jump on that just a little bit with the 1920s and 30s uh, for just a second, where um, if, uh, if you could maybe expand that out just a little bit more, Barry, about talking about the professional music and maybe talk a little bit about uh, Ralph Peer and how he created a genre of music uh, known as race records. Of course, he was drawn by the, uh, the, pro the progressive black communities of Virginia, which is where Booker T. Washington was from. And if we think of the title that Booker T. Washington had, which was the Moses of the race, that is the reason that race records are called race records. It's not any other reason beside that. So it was meant to be a progressive term and not the a demeaning term, and sometimes we have interpretations of that. So maybe if you can speak a little bit about that, Barry, then we'll uh, maybe talk about uh, the interchange between folk music and professionalism. With that. Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you started it from there, Doug, because it could expand on that a little bit. Because on one hand, yeah, it was true that they called it race and they set up this line of music with positive intent involved. This was an audience that they discovered after World War I, there were plenty of black people who had money, like there were plenty of white people that had that money. And uh, the music business finds a way to get that from you. What Steve Rose said, our, our job is to, the job of the night people to take money away from the people, from the day people. Um, it was still true then. And, and uh, there was money around. And they said, this money, this, basically they discovered this might be an addressable audience that hadn't been before. There was cash to spend. And like 1920 was the biggest sale of records until after World War II. Tens of millions of records, because radio hadn't hit yet, and you could get a record. Um, some of the interpretations of setting up separate lines for black records and white records, they were effects of that. They affected that, and they were not all positive. But I think the thing to remember when you talk about this stuff is the music business takes this on the chin. But it exists within a social situation that was racist to begin with. What are you going to get? I mean, if you have record stores where only one color of people could possibly get in, what's, what's going to happen in that store? So you can think about that and extrapolate it out to what's sold where and how does it get made. But the intent was to open things to people. And they didn't even know what that was involved. After their initial uh, successes, which were what people used to call classic jazz. It was vaudeville jazz. It was, it was, it was, it was very, it was pretty sophisticated music, actually, that um, not, not field music or you know, folk music uh, from off the plantations, um, which in many cases evolved from having heard those records, by the way. <laughs> but uh, from there, they had to figure out, what can we do? And Pierre was an experimenting kind of guy. The things that he, the, the, the lines of business that he invented whether it was those various, you know, what was a race record? They're not all going to be uh, crazy blues. So they would try. Will somebody listen to this gospel quartet? Yep. Will they listen to this larger group? Yep. That's good. And uh, what about if we, you know, it took them a while to record jazz musicians in New Orleans. I mean, he recorded, he recorded, uh, gave the go ahead to Louis Armstrong's Hot Five and Sevens and OK Records. So, what was going to be included kept expanding. Um, and even then, if you got really popular, they moved you over to the popular line, whatever color you were, because there was more money to be made. Um, it starts that way. And it doesn't mean that after we all know that you, people couldn't get locked into it and stop from that last move out of there into a larger audience got to be increasingly difficult to make. There were a lot of implications of setting it up that way. 
But uh, you know, I would maintain that that uh, it was set up with good in, uh, intentions. Um, I'll stop there. And we can jump to Guy Davis. I see you. The face of racism is economic, yeah. and these race records, selling the music, okay, that's good, that's fine. Liking the music or not liking it, that's good, that's fine. We got somebody in the White House as well. I'm not racist, I like all the race. I like, it ain't about like, it's about respect, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. That yeah. is what makes the difference between racism and not racism. And race records, this is a way of making money. And uh, so it's a part of the history. Of this, year, this country, yeah. not just black music in America. I should, can I add to one thing? Because you just made, you just made me think, yeah. Which is that, which is that from the first, Pierre began to hire black executives who were involved in the production of this music. Uh, that included Clarence Williams, who was a producer for him and a jazz musician. Uh, you may know Will Shade of Memphis Jug Band. Will was a producer in Memphis. Will had. Will had Wall Street stock and, built, and bought a house on what he made working with Beth Pierre in those days, Mayo Williams. So there were black people that from the beginning involved in the business. It was difficult. There weren't a lot, but there were. And there were artists that if they made money got paid. And there were other people that were taken advantage of, like uh, I might say happens in the music business generally and particularly in that relationship. And uh, well, that one regard where it's speaking of professionals as uh, as performers, but I would like to maybe turn it over to Tariqa for just a moment to speak about uh, speaking of the professionalism of documenting and sharing a little bit of the legacy of the music. I think that would be something that would be of interest. So in terms of roots music, we have, again, we have so many definitions of what that could be, but what, what sort of ways uh, as, as a professional documentarian, have you tried to focus it in so that people can understand what roots music means? <laughs> uh, for, for us, keeping the legacy of his music, really music uh, at times can be challenging because this is an artist who, uh, you know, has been deceased since 1949. And a lot of people now want to hear what they can see right now. And they want to see the videos, they want to see the Instagram posts, and so it's a little more challenging. And for us, one of the things that we've done is try to continue with projects. Um, we were talking backstage about uh, our recent project in 2015 where we did a five CD box set. Some music that had not been released before, some that have been released before, but bringing back, and, you know, obviously going from vinyl now to CD of his music so that it can expand to a newer audience. Uh, for us, that's a challenge, but one of the ways that we know is to get that next generation who's listening. Um, we've been thankful that you have people, you know, Levelli's music, he was not famous during his lifetime. His music, although he was a performer, uh, and Pete Seeger once told our family that he was a musician's musician. And his, his song, uh, Good Night Irene, became a number one hit six months after the Lynn Millie passed. And then you've got, you know, years later, you have people like Kurt Cobain that then made it popular again. Uh, and so those ways are very helpful and trying to help us keep that legacy alive and trying to educate more people about the roots of where uh, Smithsonian Channel did a documentary around the same time that we released the box set. And one of the things that they focused on was the Billy songs, all the songs you know, Good Night Irene, uh, In the Pines, Rock Out of Line. You know these songs, but you know them from these new artists, Ram Jam, Kurt Cobain, uh, you know, all these other artists and what they did was brought back to the history of it and where did these songs come from and how was Levelli's influence on those artists. So it's great that we try to continue those type of projects and keeping this music alive and hope to do more in the future. Absolutely. But you know, with, with you speaking about that and telling a little bit 
bit about Lynn Billy's generation, uh, his legacy for the new generation. One of the things that I, I saw that you did when we, uh, when we were part of the Carnegie Hall show was that you gave everyone uh, some bow ties for gifts and as a, a way to reference Lead Belly's legacy as a professional. And uh, could you speak a little bit about how he carried himself uh, as a, because again, Lead Belly's music, in, in case you may not be familiar with his full story, is a sort of counterbalance between commercialism and folk music and trying to balance halfway between those worlds. Because you know, as, as uh, Tarika mentioned, <coughs> And many of us might know Lead Belly's music retrospectively or through a bunch of artists who covered his material later on, but Lead Belly was kind of in a halfway point where he was very well connected within the folk music community, but that is in a non-commercial realm that is both about getting the word out, but it's not necessarily about making money as, a, as the number one thing that you're supposed to do. It's about cultural equity and cultural value. But uh, Lead Belly was known for holding himself in a particular way that showed his professionalism as as a man and as a person. And maybe if you could speak a little bit about that. Then. Well, it's interesting that you brought that up about the bow ties because one of the things um, Lead Belly in the beginning, when you saw him, he was portrayed with the prison stripes on and those type of images on the you know in the magazine articles that were written about him. But one of the things that Lynn Billy did have was a sense of pride about who he was. And that was not, and that kind of led to a breakup, sort of say, of some of the people who were working with him with the low maxes and things, because Lynn Billy really wanted to present himself as a person of great character. You know, notwithstanding the past, obviously he'd been in jail, but he had a lot of pride about what he looked like what he dressed, and going back to some of that influence with uh, <coughs> these other folk artists, Woody Guthrie, uh, Pete Seeger, Sonny Terry, Brownie McGee, all of these, they used to come to his house and just sit at his footstep and play with him, and he was older than them. But so one of the things um, that are out there now, Lev Billy is in a suit. He's either got a bow tie on or he has a tie, and that was, image that he wanted portrayed about him that I think a lot of people did not know because it was great to sensationalize his uh, past when it came to, uh, you know, prison. But that's not the image he wanted out. That's a, that's a beautiful thing, you know, and that's, that's something as well that is a strong part of African American culture is that especially in times when you could not speak out in, in a day-to-day -day situation, part of a how you dressed and the image that you presented of yourself, that, that told a lot about, uh, about your background. And you know, that's even a, you know, one of them in my most recent album, I have a picture of my grandmother, and it was the, it's, it's one of the few pictures of her wearing pants. She was wearing uh, some cowboy, cowboy wear for a Western parade. But it was the only time she wore pants because she was part of the Church of God in Christ. And so every day that I ever knew her in my life, she was wearing a dress that went all the way down to her ankles because that was required of her. But she was also extremely classy with how she did it every single day. And so that's a, that's something that, that's why I wanted to bring that up because Lead Billy took a lot of pride in his suits and making sure that he looked the best that he could possibly look. But let's move to you for a second, Stephen, and speak about professionalism and a little bit of that, uh, well, I, you know, the things that you were saying about Lead Belly, I think point to this, this bigger kind of tendency that we need to be aware of, of, of just this, this uh, wanting to like, fetishize or sensationalize, um, particularly musicians coming out, you know, African-American musicians who come up in the 19th or the 20th centuries and kind of these, these uh, you know, mythical or, you know, kind of yeah, mythical origins or hiding the, the violence and the, the environment they were playing in. As a way of making, um, I'm trying to think of the right word for it, but it, it, I was thinking about a conversation that Barry and I were just having about Robert Johnson and the devil. <laughs> and, and I mean, really, you know, the, these conversations about a musician like Robert Johnson, to bring up another example of someone who was a, you know, a very disciplined professional musician, who had a very wide repertoire of music, and clearly practiced a lot. And 
living, you know, honed his trade. Um, you know, the, the, the kind of the stories about the crossroads and the devil can distract from, you know, what was someone who took pride in the craft, you know, and then think about, you know, sensationalizing uh, Billy's time in prison. Also, you know, draw attention away from what he was supposed to be most proud of, which was the art that he devoted himself to and spent time really crafty. Um, and so, you know, I think that it, it just maybe comes from the, the sense of, you know, particularly music coming out of the Deep South in the early 20th century as having been exotic in some kind of way, you know, and, and thinking about, um, it, you know, just thinking about the way we remember that past, you know, really, it really becomes urgent when we're talking about musicians from the Billy's generation and also people like Robert Johnson and other people who talk about the history of blues and African American blues music uh, to think about that. You know, these were very, you know, usually men and women who took what they were doing very seriously, even as they also were devoted to helping people have a good time. You know, that is a profession that they, uh, you know, were. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to think of it. <laughs> it's, it, well, it's almost an exercise in the double consciousness that W.E.B. Yeah. Du Bois speaks about, where you have two different images. There's an image at home and there is an image that is the public image, and that's something to always keep in mind when looking at a lot of this African-American roots music and the history of it, because it's that's the thing too, between, you know, there's the point after after emancipation, that's one era, in the, in the Reconstruction era, that's a whole other era, the pre-World War II era in the turn of the century, then after this first World War, then there's the era going from the 20s, 30s, then we have the, pre-Second World War, then afterward in the Civil Rights era, then even the Black Power Movement, and then the 80s and <laughs> leading up to this point, we have different ideas that come with every single generation. And that's something that can, you know, when considering African American roots music, that's something to, to keep in mind, seeing what are, the, what are the cultural statements that each of these artists are making there. And, uh, well, uh, I'd like to just, uh, well, we're in, we're in sort of a, the headier part of the conversation, speaking about just the, the presentation, but let's take a, a minute on repertoire here. And of course, since we've, we've gotten to, onto the subject of Lead Belly and the diversity of his repertoire, I'd like to pass it over to Guy for just a moment here, and just maybe if you could speak a little bit about um, what makes Lead Belly's repertoire so unique, and how does that how does that uh, inform? African American roots music as we see it now. That belly gave a voice and a historical recording to the voiceless. I'm talking about men in particular who were in prisons. There were songs that he learned in prison, songs that you do when you're laboring for hours and hours and hours at a time in the hot sun. Sometimes those songs are repetitive, work songs. We have to sing them to you hypnotize yourself so you're not thinking about what you're doing. You just keep doing it and doing it. You gotta chop logs for hours and hours and hours. That old song Stewball, where uh, when Stewball uh -huh, was a racehorse, uh -huh, he knew that on that uh -huh, that axe was falling. Uh -huh. uh, Led Belly gave a voice to people through songs like Midnight Special. He didn't write, I don't believe he wrote it as much as this was somehow that, that song in the prison. And maybe it was one of the work songs, amongst um, work songs and stuff that he did. Um, he was a songster, much like yourself there, Dr. Fleming. So oh. <laughs> maybe not a songster. <laughs> um, Woody Guthrie said something important about Led Belly. He said, when Led Belly learned to play the guitar, he didn't use enough music books to put on the floor, make a pile big enough to burn. He figured out that guitar and he heard people singing and he sang himself and the songs were carried in his memory and he carried them forward. That would be a way of saying what Led Belly's contribution was. And I gotta pass it on to people like um, anthropologists like Zora Neale Hurston, what they really did with music, Zora Neale did with stories and with songs too. The culture was passed along. She heard it from people's mouths. This was an oral culture, oral tradition, oral thing, no tablet tradition. Yeah. Um, there were songs that got passed along, and thank God for folks like Woody Guthrie and Conceiva who would carry.
carried these along, and then Big Bill Brunsey and Mississippi John Hurt, people who would hear these songs and make their own interpretations. So he was a historian, and his credentials would outdo his table. They'd have to make him doctor, doctrinist, full doctor, doctor, doctor. That uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, jukebox, uh, yeah. because he had a repertoire of over 200 songs that he could sing on demand. Yeah. That's him. <laughs> Is that the ghost of Lake Billy Cole? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Don't laugh. Yeah. 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 But, but that's, a, that's something as well that um, as we see the translation from, uh, from folk tradition or from learned music, going into the commercially viable zone of, uh, of recorded music and commercialization, that's when you see much of this repertoire reduced or, um, I guess, hyper-focused into a certain idea. And that's, that's something as well. One of the things that I learned very early on, especially through the music of Lead Belly, is that the blues and jazz and spiritual music, that was the exception to the rule because it was actually one small piece of the puzzle compared to a far larger piece that was out in the world, out in the open, and for one reason or another, it was not documented as, as well as something else. And that was, of course, because they found a, a certain formula that worked, and then they sold that formula for as much as they could through the recording industry. And that was, again, not like Barry mentioned earlier, I wouldn't say necessarily, uh, the intention wasn't necessarily negative, but you know, commercial business, you're always trying to go for the next dollar, more so than the cultural artifact. And we just happened to be fortunate. There were the, those couple of mistakes that gave us the, the template for uh, what we now think of as uh, African-American roots music. But um, uh, since we're getting toward the second half of our time, I'd like to shift gears. We've been in the, just the, the historical, the far, far back past of African American roots music, but I'd like to speak a little bit on the sort of the folk revival era because now that is getting to be a bit of the, the past as well. Um, you know, I'm thinking about people like uh, that were influenced by Lead Belly, like people like Harry Belafonte or Paul Robeson and, and people along those lines. And, and maybe if um, Stephen, I think uh, since you're, you've been curating the museum, what, what sort of uh, uh, what sort of icons of the of the genre uh, have you all been focusing on in the new museum that that would tell a bit of that story of African American roots music? Yeah. So in particular, I mean, related to Paul Robeson, we have a few different really significant artifacts from his career. In particular, the work he did um, on the spirituals, you know, such as um, you know a couple of early seventy eights and recorded of like. River and other you know similar pieces out of that tradition, um, and then you know the, the the interesting thing about Paul Robeson in particular, because of the kind of breadth of his activity, you know he's, he's very difficult to you know from a curatorial perspective, really difficult to slot into one particular position. Uh, not only because of the different areas of entertainment in which he was involved, but also because of kind of just the the way that all of that entertainment involvement, in particular his involvement with folk music, was intimately tied into his political activism. Um, and so really, you know, the best way I think to highlight the legacy of someone like a Robeson or someone like Harry Belafonte is to combine the kind of artifact-based tutorial work we do with a robust kind of like schedule of programs like we also have, you know, because I think a big part of this is not only presenting to items from like Eric Belafonte or Paul Robeson for people to come see, but also, you know, having things like live performance and discussion like we're doing to really foster the kind of dialogue that uh, the user was into part of that and now. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that, well, that's a beautiful thing. And also being able to uh, have a, a diverse amount of perspectives to tell that narrative as well, I believe very important piece of the puzzle as well, because I think, um, again, with, with the ten, intent, uh, if we take the intention as being, you know, in a righteous place, whatever that might be for the documentation, the diversity of voices that have been telling the stories has been limited, and I think that now in the 21st century, 
we have an opportunity to be able to tell those stories and be the storytellers that are, that are creating and also driving the narrative that goes forward. And I think that that's a, a beautiful thing. And I, I can't wait to see this museum uh, opening up, I believe, at the end of next year is when uh, it's slated to open right across from the Rhyme, and that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, Barry? Yeah, I, even this panel today, I think, you know, if you, you, you look at the folk revival years, and what it made really clear to everybody is, like, who gets to be in charge of the narrative of what it is that we're looking at? Right. Um, if what people took from the folk revival was that uh, Muddy Waters was great because he made the world safe for Keith Richards. <laughs> you see, which was easily done. That was about half a step away where here's Joe Myers, boy, she sings that pretty. So the question, that's, that's the danger. Now, there's nothing wrong about interchange. I mean, it's always going on and we expect it. But that now the narrative is coming from where it started out and the scholars like yourselves here are doing it is such a big deal for those of us who want to hear the story straight. Absolutely. You have some control of our own narrative, which is starting, not just starting here, but it's apparent up here on this panel. And thanks to some folks like Dom Flemings, who, with his talents and opportunities, is bringing these things to light, that there are stories that need telling, and that we've got to repeat them, we've got to spread them, we've got to discuss them. And I'm hoping that in the museum, in relationship to uh, Paul Robeson, by the way, and it is pronounced Robeson, I know the folks that know him. Um, that things will be brought up about Harry Belafonte, Paul Robeson, and Josh White yes. having to do with the whole Red Scare. And they wanted to see what side the black folks was on. Was they going to come down with the communists? Or were they come down with the capitalists? <laughs> um, there are stories to be told and stories to be heard. Absolutely. And, that, and there's, uh, as I mentioned before, there's, there are so many different directions that we can go with it. You know, of course, with a, you know, one of the beauties of the folk revival era is that we have a whole generation of interpreters that took the old field recordings and brought them into a new light. And of course, the, the black folk singer is another underrepresented uh, part of the field. Um, as, a, as a record collector myself, uh, of course, there was Josh White Sr., and Josh White Jr., Harry Belafonte, Paul Robeson. Uh, but then I also started finding other singers and musicians like Joe and Eddie, who were a beautiful duo that sang spiritual music. And uh, even uh, people like, uh, well, he, he's, he's uh, I wouldn't say African-American, but uh, Latin American fellow, uh, Jackie Washington, who is also a part of the, a part of the Club 47 scene. He was, he was one of the most popular performers of, of his era over at, at Club 47, along with Tom Rush. But again, very underrepresented when you look at the big scheme of things. And then, of course, there's the, in the folk revival, he had a very interesting interchange between the urban interpreters and then the rural interpreters, or sometimes the original performers. That's when you have the blues revival, where people like Mississippi John Hurt are being uh, being uh, uh, rediscovered, I've heard, is not the best term anymore, but uh, people went down and found that they've just been living in the, <laughs> living at home, and then they, uh, they brought them up north and, and started having them perform out. People like Skip James as well, and uh, Robert Pete Williams, and so many amazing performers, and so that's a whole other piece of the history, and uh, I guess, uh, well, Guy just showed me an amazing photo of himself with uh, one of the uh, one of the fathers of black uh, the black uh, folk music revival, uh, Taj Mahal, uh, of them playing a guy's double double neck twelve string six string guitar from the 70s, and uh, uh, and then from a <laughs> and now as as someone who's a, has been a professional uh, folk singer. Uh, for many years, Guy, is there, are there any insights that, that you found in your journey that, um, that uh, were, let me think how, how to describe it, are there any particular insights as an interpreter of African American roots music that you found in your journeys around the world that have, um, that people may not, may not think about, I'll say that. I've got an insight for you. Never assume that you know everything walking into a situation. 
back in the 70s, I got to go to John, uh, St. John's Island. South Carolina, with the, with the Gullah culture is alive. I went to the Moving Star Hall Baptist Church. And the congregation is singing, and the organist stops, and the piano player stops, and they do something that's just hand clapping and singing. Fix me, Jesus, fix me, right? Fix me. And the whole congregation, mostly black, was clapping on the beat. And I said, wait a minute, what, what, what happened? Did they learn this from Eastern Europe? What, what, <laughs> what happened to off the paper? Yeah. And they clapped on the beat, and I didn't understand. And I'm, I'm sitting there wondering, you know, what's five or something? And the next thing I knew, these two, these two old women had, had been going up and down the aisle, kind of shuffling side to side. Next thing I knew, the whole church broke it. Doing this triple clap thing, and, and I, I jumped up, and I almost joined the church. <laughs> so it went beyond the borders of America. This went from Gullah back maybe eastward to Angola. I don't know, you know, in, in Africa. So. Boom. All I can say to these people how how erudite I am, so full of erudition. I need a laxative or something to do. Uh, they broke my brain open when they when that whole congregation busted out. And like at the same time, when I'm the guy with the bone. Oh, oh, I see. All right. <laughs> so, yeah, that's a, well. That's a beautiful point. And, and when you, when you go out, yeah, just yeah, I think you hit hit a great point there. Of, of, no matter how far you studied into it, you still got to go out there. There's still so much information and so much amazing music that still can just take you on a on a on a ride that you just didn't know that it was out there. You know, that's a beautiful thing. And Barry, again, okay. yeah, I'm going to do everybody one little favor here today. It actually relates to what we just said about creolization and 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 and, and that the story goes beyond the borders of America that we're talking about. Um, do you favor the most. The, the most important book, or somebody else said, it's not mine, and in the last 10 years, I want you to know about it, is a book by Christopher Smith called The Creolization of American Culture, The Roots of Blackface Minstrelsy. Because we all have this great American embarrassment that so much of our popular music worked its way through that often ugly thing. This book, in its original research, takes the story back 50, 60 years before minstrelsy. And what you discover something is it's going to, a story that's going to feel very familiar to people in Americana music, which is that you had this point coming out of the time of around the War of 1812, where three black sailors and white sailors were working the same ships, coming off those ships, singing the same songs, and they were performing for people in places like Brooklyn and the harbor. Uh, people were building the canals together in places like Cincinnati, these places of interaction or the place where this music started to get mixed. And a lot of the free blacks at that time were out of the Caribbean. So there was this strong Bermuda, Barbados, Jamaican influence in the music, and it starts to affect the dances. And if you want to watch the music change, you don't listen to the people with the 28 verse stories. You look at where they were dancing. And this book, by use of visuals of the time, was able to pin down the changes in American dancing from 1810 to 1840. And then there was, a, there was an alternate press called the Flash Press that reported on this kind of thing. And it was a scene where bohemian kids, three blacks and whites, were making music together. And it was transgressive, and it was funny, and it was scabrous, and they were doing nasty jokes and everything else. And it was immensely popular. And some of the people who found it, professional blackface minstrels, come out of that area, or, or, or at least seen it. And basically what you had was somebody saying, once again, there's some money to be made out of this thing, which has been happening down here on the docks and in the streets. It wasn't even in the South. It was very often in New York, uh, along Long Island, and in places where they were building the canals. But there was this interchange that took place by 1810, 1820, and uh, in effect, blackface minstrelsy was a popular, a popular music commercialization of what people have been doing themselves. Which is, so I recommend this book to you. It'll change the way you look at it. Well, I can't wait to check that book out and see what, see what it's all about. Well, we've only got just a little bit of time here left, and we've been speaking a lot about the past. Yes? Do you, you take any questions today? Yeah, we will take, okay. take a few questions. Just, uh, just briefly, I'd like to speak of the future of African American roots music. And of course, uh, Stephen, you have the, the new museum that you're, that you're working at there. Maybe just make
mention a little bit of that, and of course, Chirika, I'd like you to mention a little bit about the Lead Belly Foundation and the work you all have been doing to continue on this wonderful work. Then we'll open up for a few questions. Sure. So I think the most important thing we can do from this perspective uh, for the future is, is really to take, try to take as much of the complexity of this history that we've been talking about to include things that are, you know, not documented on early recordings, things like that, and make it accessible to young people, both young scholars and especially young performers. You know, I think what we see when we talk about the folk revival in the 60s and what we see with young performers today in this genre and then in other genres as well is the, the way that these lessons and this art from the, pa the past can be refashioned and reinterpreted as a commentary on contemporary life, right? So we really have this amazing wellspring of culture that is available to us, and I think our role as a museum is just to make that something that is uh, in wider circulation, right? And to make people aware of it. You know, there's a lot of these things that until people see presented to them, they don't even know will appeal to them, or they don't even know will be relevant. Uh, so, you know, what we're trying to do for the future is to kind of broaden the palette of sound that, you know, young people who are into music, uh, older people who are into music, uh, have access to. Uh, both for their own enjoyment and for whatever they're doing creatively. Beautiful. That's wonderful. And Tarika, if you could say just one word about the Lead Belly Foundation, that you to... Yeah, one of the things that we're doing with the foundation, um, and it, it, Lead Belly have a love for children. Anybody that knows a little bit about his music knows that he had a great love for children and performing for children. So one of the things that my grandmother did when she started the foundation was to provide scholarships for young kids who um, come from backgrounds who maybe cannot afford music lessons, but have the desire to. So we do that by helping them with scholarships, but also by camps, and you guys talk about summer camps. <laughs> and one of the things that we do every summer is a music and arts camp, where we're introducing these young kids to Live Belly's music, to what is kind of the foundation of a lot of folk and a lot of blues. Um, everything from just even educating them about the 12 string guitar. And you'd be amazed at how many, you know, we always have somebody that walks away who's now interested in an instrument that they normally would not have been. Um, and it's a very hard instrument, so um, we're willing to certainly help uh, that child in any way possible um, because it's the love for the music, the type of music as well. Um, but also just knowing who Lev Billy was and his, his place in history and his influence. That's wonderful. Well, that's a, about all the time we have for uh, our, our discussion here with the panel. I'd like to open the floor for questions if anybody has has some questions for our panelists. Yeah, I've learned a lot about the uh, African-American musical experience. Uh, yeah. I, I learned, uh, oh, I've learned a lot from the... From the uh, about the uh, music of African American musical experience from Mr. Barry Mazur's book, uh, like the Ralph Peer book, and also from uh, Mr. Gary Davis's concerts. They're just incredible, not just incredibly talented, but also the, what you learn from the history that you get during the concert. But I I am uh, frustrated by the uh, the lack of information between all. Of, you may have answered. Uh, Mr. Mazur may have answered this question partly, is uh, there's so little information between the, this, the, the emancipation and, um, say, Charlie Patton uh, of the folk level that you've got the black minstrelsy and, and then the, you just mentioned the, the, 18, the War of 1812 period, but there's so little in that after the cakewalk and all that uh, and I'm not talking about sophisticated stuff like ragtime and so forth, but the more folky stuff. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, uh, but and so your question is, is that where can you find more? In, if, is there any information, or, or and if so, where can you find it? I would say start looking in the black codes. Yeah. Well, that was, yeah, and that was that was one of the reasons that the Lomaxes went to the prison is that they were looking for the older forms of black music in, in terms of, it was sort of a social experiment where they said, well, 
because at that time, there were many of the people of the African American community that were a, a more sophisticated culture. They were part of the church, and they did not want to associate with the secular music because it was known as the devil's music. And so they they pretty much, uh, the Lomaxes pretty much said, well, we got to find where the sinful people are, which was in the prisons. And sometimes many of these, uh, these uh, inmates had been in the prisons for so long, sadly enough, that they retained an older culture. So that was part of the social experiment is that they were trying to find older culture within the penitentiaries, which they did, they found that that, ex that experiment worked in some regards where they found a lot of older songs. Um, well, and then also, there's a lot of books about the subject, you know, like that was one of the reasons that I put together my Black Cowboys albums, because when I started looking into that history, I found that there was a story that was being told that went from the 1870s all the way up into the 1960s, and there were a lot of musical examples that either there were songs specifically, like Goodbye Old Paint, which was a song learned from a, an ex-slave that, uh, that taught it to a, a white man who became a fiddler that recorded for John Lomax. Um, and then other examples of finding just a repertoire that was that told a cultural story that linked parts of the, that history together. And so there's a lot of there's a lot of room. There are a lot of archives out there that people can search and they can find the information. You know, that's that's one of the things that one of the the great uh, one of the great mistakes many people have made is that all of the information has been uh, researched and pulled out of the archives, and only about 1%, if that, have ever been researched in the archives. So there's there's a lot of digging through the Library of Congress, through a lot of all the different archives that are in every name university in this country that can still be, still be dealt with. Can you repeat the, I'm sorry, can you repeat the name of that book? Oh, the, which book? The one you just mentioned. Uh, about the Black Cowboys? Yes. Well, that's, that's an that's album. Called, it's called Black Cowboys. Oh. You can find it. It's just So there's a 40-page booklet that I wrote with it about the history of Black Cowboys and how it connects some of that history. But that's just one story of many, many stories that haven't been told. But let's get to another one or two questions, and, and, and then we'll have to finish up with the panel. Yes? Uh, yeah, I've been doing some research on the gospel music in Kansas City and ran across this uh, Black University in a small town that doesn't exist anymore, Flindero, Kansas. And it was important during the pre-Civil War as a station on the Underground Railroad. And then Western University, which was run by the AME Church, developed. And out of that small university was a singing group called Jackson Jubilee Singers. And they traveled around, it turns out they traveled around the country and Canada. And I'd never heard of them before. And, and found that the University of Iowa had bunch of research on it because they were on the Chicago movement. Like, like you were saying, the stuff does exist if you can find it. But my question has to do with what I really found interesting is how these traveling uh, singing groups from some of these black colleges and the Fisk uh, Singers and the Hampton uh, Jubilee Singers and uh, how they preserved the uh, spiritual uh, and how that seemed to almost be dying out. And I was wondering if the if your museum uh, or there are other people doing research on how some of these uh, black colleges and their singing groups actually saved the spirituals and, and made that link to more uh, modern music uh, today. Uh, so I have a, a couple of things to say uh, both in, in response to your question and then also a little bit of a, uh, maybe a continuation of the previous question as well. The first thing being that the short answer is yes. So actually, our first uh, temporary exhibition in the museum will be dedicated to the Fisk Jubilee Singers, and will you know feature artifacts uh, to, you know borrowed from the Special Collections Library at Fisk, including some things from their early tours of Europe, along with a really detailed recounting of uh, their early history of touring in the 1870s and 1880s. Um, and it's interesting what you're talking about of the role of Jubilee groups in kind of presenting and also preserving uh, this older folk tradition of the spirituals. And I think that, you know, thinking about that, that kind of poorly documented period after the Civil War going to the early 20th century, um, there, there are some types of music I think that we do have more documentation of that give maybe windows into, you know, some of 
some of the traditions of that era that otherwise were the documents, at least the recordings. I mean, so thinking about the Fisker Lee singers, the way that they performed the spirituals is not the way that the spirituals were being sung, say, on plantations in the 1860s or 1850s. Uh, what they were doing is what we would think of as classicized spirituals. That is, the melody of a spiritual, more or less, adapted to the uh, choral tradition of Western music, right? So singing and spiritual with classical inflection and training, right? And so in a lot of ways, what, say, Scott Joplin and James Scott did in ragtime was to take at least some of the techniques and other ideas coming out of, say, uh, you know, various black folk melodies that may have been floating around the Midwest and kind of put them into a classical structure that really resembles like the marches of Sousa and things like that. And so if you listen to the melodies of Joplin's rags, or if you listen to, you know, various performances about the history of police singers and ranges about the police singers, what you get is, with a little bit of imagination anyway, is a little bit of a link to earlier traditions that did not make it on the record or were not transcribed, other things like that, um, because the, you know, the musicians who performed this music, arranged it, or composed it, were distilling influences that they had absorbed coming up in, you know, these rural black communities in the decades following the Civil War, right? So there's, and if you listen to Joplin's opera, Trimonisha, also, you know, again, you get glimpses of what musical culture could have been like, say, in the 1870s, you know, when Joplin was young. Anyway, so it's really fascinating, and there's, there's a, some imaginative work you have to do there, but it's also like, you know, they, these composers and arrangers and performers were preserving a much older tradition and is in the music, you know, uh, maybe not always explicitly. Yeah. Well, wonderful. Well, we've got, well, we're getting, we're getting this, the high sign to, to wrap it up. If we got just one more question, we'll take that. But uh, just one quick question. Anyway, no, no quick questions. No, nothing. No. All right. Oh, here we go. I'm in a band from New York uh, called uh, Band in the Groom Western Scriptures, and one of our percussionists is um, Dr. David Pleasant, so he embraces the, the Gullah Geechee culture. And we have done uh, numerous gigs, and we're surprised to find that a lot of people don't know what Gullah Geechee music is. Well, you know, that's the thing that, that is, uh, yeah. I hope in this panel we've, we've shared that uh, yeah. many times, is that there is so much music that you have to revive even the interpretation and the discussion about yeah. the music every single generation because there's no guarantee that the folk music traditions will inherently be a part of the next round of people and so that's something we've we've said in various frames in one way or another that there's always interpreting bringing that music out to the forefront and explaining and discussing the complex issues and the and the also the beautiful history as well that is around a lot of this beautiful roots music that's that's something that's uh, you know is always needed and so but we've run out of time like i said before we could talk about this for another three hours and barely scratch the surface as taj told me before you can dig and dig into this music for the next hundred years and found you barely cracked the crust on the on the on this pie, that's uh, that's about all we've got time for. Let me get let's give it up one more time for our wonderful panelists.